In his first public comments on the topic since leaving the CIA, retired Army General David Petraeus last week argued that the hard-won counterinsurgency and irregular warfare lessons of Iraq and Afghanistan must be remembered given America will face similar conflicts in the future. He spoke after accepting the Chesney Gold Medal issued by Britain's Royal Uniformed Services Institute in London that recognizes major contributors to military thought. Past winners include American sea power theorist Alfred Thayer Mahan, Winston Churchill and British visionaries like JFC Fuller and Basil Liddell Hart. Petraeus' comments come as America draws down in Afghanistan and a war-weary Pentagon turns away from manpower-intensive counterinsurgency operations as it faces up to $500 billion in additional defense cuts. Here to talk about Petraeus' remarks is John Noggle of the Center for a New American Security, who is also a member of the influential Defense Policy Board that advises Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel. Noggle is a retired Army Lieutenant Colonel who was part of the team that worked for Petraeus to shape the counterinsurgency strategy that turned the tide of the Iraq War. John, welcome to the program. It's good to be back. It was, it was also good to see uh, General Petraeus actually mention, uh, mention your work in his acceptance speech. It's kind of good. Um, a, a critic would say it's no surprise that David Petraeus, who played such a, a key role in the counterinsurgency strategy, would be making this case. Uh, and I understand that you're not the most unbiased observer because you two were involved in that effort. But tell us why he's right and are his remarks going to make a difference in this emerging debate? The reason I think General Petraeus, Dr. Petraeus is correct it, that counterinsurgency isn't going to go away is quite simply that insurgency isn't going away. In fact, arguably, we're living in an age of insurgency. We're currently supporting an insurgency in Syria, having recently supported one in Libya. Uh, we're conducting counterinsurgency operations in support of our partners in the Philippines, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan. There is every indication that Rebellions. Columbia was another one, Columbia was another one a, and a successful counterinsurgency right. campaign. The Colombians actually now are exporting security. They have excess capacity, which they're using to, to try to improve security uh, in their region and perhaps around the globe. So it, I, I think it's, it's um, far from impossible that we're living in an age of insurgency, and hence that the counterinsurgency lessons we paid for in blood and treasure are going to remain useful, should not be we shouldn't burn the books again as we did after Vietnam. Um, is there a sense that those books are being burned? Because I sense that that, that is true, because the 2012 strategy said, made clear that the nation must maintain coin capabilities, counterinsurgency capabilities, but to a lesser extent than in the past. And yet, in some of the actions we've seen the services make, they seem to be saying, let's just go back to the old ways of doing warfare because this stuff is just too complicated. Uh, the organizational cultures of the individual services of the Department of Defense as a whole certainly incline toward what Russ Wigley called the American way of war. The idea that we can overcome our enemies with technology, with firepower, and, and send a bullet rather than a man. Uh, I think that the character of warfare in our modern age is changing. The, the very fact that we are so good at the American way of war makes it almost impossible for anyone to compete against us. And, and therefore, our enemies are likely to continue to choose to fight us as insurgents. And therefore, I think we, we have to maintain the capability, the knowledge at least, uh, some of the specialized skills that we've learned and, and paid for in, in order to mitigate against the chance that we're going to have to do this again. But, but how strong is the movement within the institution, institutions, to do that? Because you see evidence that folks really want to sort of move away from it. You know, the, the, these training centers are very expensive, Vago. You know, I mean, they cost a lot of money. They're very manpower intensive. Is this going to make a difference in the debate about how much capacity we need? The debate is so skewed right now that, that this is really a side argument. So sequestration has done is doing. It's a, a slow motion train wreck that continues and it looks like is likely to continue for at least another year. But we're shutting down fighter squadrons. Uh, the Army has canceled at least a half a dozen rotations at its National Training Center, the very troop intensive exercises of which you speak, which are, are, are necessary both to prepare the military for the high end capabilities that, that they definitely need to deter our enemies and, and also prevent us from practicing the, the lower end skills. And, and so we are opening up opportunities for our adversaries by reducing training, by uh, misallocating defense dollars, and, and I really think Congress has a lot to answer for. Um, it, from the standpoint of maintaining these skills, I mean, these are very, very perishable skills. We got very good at it because guys were doing it every day, making mistakes and learning on the fly, and then figuring out a brilliant system to get those lessons back out to folks to, to be in a constant learning track. If we're not doing it all the time, what's the right way to keep some of these skills fresh? 
So the, the good news is that an awful lot of these skills are relatively inexpensive to acquire or maintain, uh, certainly as compared to tank gunnery, one of my favorite things, but a very expensive thing. So language skills, maintaining, developing language skills, cultural understanding, um, the, the principles of counterinsurgency, the history of warfare, all are, are relatively cheap, and, and there are a series of really good books coming out right now so we can educate even if we're unable to train because of a lot of the decisions that are being made about budget allocations. Uh, when, when we talk about capacity, though, how much capacity is enough capacity? I mean, right now, most of the U.S. Army was engaged in that task, or much of the deployable part of the Army was engaged in that task, for example, and much of the Marine Corps. How much of an emphasis does this have to be, or does this just have to be a standard training element that every single person in the force has got to go through? I think every person in the force has to at least have an understanding of the basic principles, should understand the concept of war among the peoples, as General British General Rupert Smith called it, and, and should have a, a familiarity. We should then have some experts who have special capabilities and particular knowledge skills, cultural understanding, political skills, training skills. And, and if there is one mistake I think we've made, it's that we have not institutionalized the training and advising skill set that I think is going to be a very important part, perhaps the most important part, of what the U.S. Army does in this century. Uh, there is, let me, let me just take um, a, a slight diversion and go to the question of, you know, because obviously any, any op military operation, you know, as, as General Petraeus ended his speech, you know, we don't get to choose the wars that we go into. Um, and enemies certainly have a vote in how those turn out. Drones are a major part of our strategy in fighting the war on terror, or, or at least has been. The administration has tried to be somewhat more open about it. How much how strong do you believe is the argument that we're actually doing more damage through these strikes rather than less damage, that we're creating more insurgents than we're solving? Uh, I think that the drone program has improved dramatically over time. We are much better at correlating data from a number of different programs, some of which have been much in the news recently, and, and we've r dramatically reduced the, the amount of collateral damage we do. In fact, we've been so successful with the drone strikes against Al-Qaeda Central and in the, the tribal regions of Pakistan in particular that we are now reaching the point of diminishing returns. And, and you've seen a diminution in drone strikes, not, I don't think, because of the number of collateral damage, we, the amount of collateral damage we produce and, and hence the costs of, of increasing the number of insurgents we have to fight, but because the, the targets simply aren't there anymore. And, and, and briefly, you were bullish that Afghanistan was going to turn all right, Taliban's been making gains, are you still bullish? I am cautiously optimistic that the Afghan government will continue after 2014 and that as long as the United States remains committed in a training and advisory role, continues to provide some air power support, in particular, the U.S. Congress provides the funds that are going to be required to sustain the Afghan army, that Afghanistan will hold together. It won't be pretty. It will be deeply unsatisfying, but it will accomplish core national security objectives of our country. John, thanks very much for joining us. We'd like to have you back again. Coming up, how the Pentagon will respond. To